Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you all for coming. If you could please get seated, we're about to start. My name is Burton Woodhull. I'm a first year MBA here at MIT Sloan. I have the distinct honor of being the lead for today's panel, Negotiations Past, Present, and Future. Um, and I'd like to introduce our guests here. Starting closest to me, we have Jeff Pash, who's the EVP, General Counsel of the NFL. We have David Falk, founder of Fame, Inc., sports agency. Michael Yormark, president of Rock Nation. Daryl Morey, GM of Rockets. And today's panel is moderated by Deepak Malhotra, who is a professor at HBS. And so without further ado, let's get it started. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to be talking about sports and sports analytics, and we're going to be talking about negotiation more specifically. The way we're going to try and do it, as well as we can organize it in advance, is to uh, talk about it in a, sort of three different uh, segments, three themes. Uh, the first one, we're going to really start out talking about data analytics and the effect that data analytics have had and are having and might have on negotiations of various kinds that take place in sports. Then we're going to transition a little bit away from the data analytics part and talk about some of the softer aspects of negotiation, the environments in which the negotiations themselves take place, et cetera. And we might get some more insights from these folks based on their experience, how these things turn out when you start looking beyond the tangibles, beyond the data. And then the third segment is going to be a bunch of rapid fire questions. They're all in the hot seat, one word answers, and we're going to get to see a little bit about how they think about negotiation. So they don't know what those questions are going to be, so we'll see how that works out. Once we've done some of that, we're going to open it up to the questions from the audience. If any of you have any questions, uh, you can send them in. I think uh, there's, there's a mechanism in place for you yeah. to do that, and you probably know it better than I do. All I know is that they're likely to show up on this screen at some point. So we'll open up to audience the, questions. You Anything you have. Twitter handle? Or is there a, I, it's up there? OK, you have to use that Twitter pound hash sign. There you go. Yeah. All right, so. <laughs> I'm an old computer science guy. It's a pound. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Daryl, for uh, clarifying things. <laughs> yes. Uh, and any question is valid as far as you putting it in. I know there's going to be a filtering process. I'll look at it, and, uh, and I'll try to ask whatever question I think might generate the, the best combination of heat and light, rather than just all of one and, and none of the other. So with having said that, let's, let's jump into the question. I'm going to start out with Jeff on the far end. Jeff and I have known each other for a few years. Uh, we finally have somebody on this panel who represents a league. Uh, so if you can give us your thoughts on how data and data analytics have shaped the way collective bargaining agreement negotiations are done or other negotiations you get involved with, that would be a great way to start off. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and with respect to your question, uh, Professor, I think what we have seen in our league is that over the past 20 years or so, as we've transitioned from the old Roselle rule system to a salary cap with very robust free agency, rookie systems and the like, that data analytics has played a real role in determining how the salary cap will be set, how the rookie system will be structured, how much will be allocated towards different classes of players, and very importantly, the relative mix between player salaries and player benefits of the total cost structure. How much of that will go towards pensions, medical care, other kinds of insurance, post-career benefits, and how much of it will be available for salaries and individual negotiations. And all of that is part of the analytic an analysis that has to be done. Would you say that bargain. that's made it easier to negotiate the deals? Has it made the deals fairer in some way? Has it made it that everybody's looking at the same stuff, so this is less surprises? I mean, what, what does it do? No, I, I, I'd, I think I'd say this. It has made uh, the negotiations in some ways more complicated, because as you have more data, it takes longer and, and you have to do more to work through it. I think it's made it more reliable in the sense that people have a clear understanding and a common data set to work off of. So a lot of the issues of whether one side has disproportionate knowledge and therefore an advantage has been eliminated. And I think it's probably gotten you to a better result because it's one where people have greater confidence in the outcome. Okay. Yeah, in a moment, I want to get all the way to the, the player perspective on this. Before that, let's go to the team perspective. Daryl, from your point of view, when you're negotiating deals, uh, how much of what happens in a negotiation, let's say you're trying to, to get a player, how much of it is dependent on data that everybody can see versus how good you are at analyzing data versus other stuff, like your negotiation ability? I think it's almost all the latter. Like the data and the analysis is done by both sides. But it's frankly, in my experience, it's mostly uh, to do things like create plausible anchored first offers 
um, you know, to help you explain why you're making offers so they feel like, but at the end of the day, uh, at least in our, you know, in my world, and I think uh, David and uh, Michael's world, it's all about, it's all about, uh, mostly about leverage, mostly about how many bidders, mostly about mm -hmm. the demand of that player. Uh, <coughs> it's, uh, you know, it's just, just like if you're selling a house, right? Um, you know, you can do analysis of what it's worth, but it's only worth what someone will pay and how many how many bidders there are on each side. So I find it just sets the atmosphere, but it doesn't so, drive. So, so if it all went away, so, so Jeff mentioned that, you know, it, it may lead to better outcomes, but it also makes it more complicated. You've suggested that, yeah, it has some effect on the way the thing is, uh, the conversation goes at the, at the outset. If we just took away all data and data analytics, would that make your life better or worse? Uh, I, easier, harder? I think it's, honestly, I think it's neutral. I think because each side is so focused on achieving, I mean, you want to reach a win-win outcome if you can, but because everyone's so focused on representing their side uh, in these multi-party negotiations, multiple teams, um, at the end of the day, they'll, they'll send us information, and we generally ignore it, and we send them information, and they generally ignore it. So Got that's it. my experience. All right. Uh, so it sounds like a lot of uh, wasted effort in some ways. I, I, you could argue in this case, you know, if you had, just like in any competitive environment, uh, a Watch lot of things, up. everyone has to add to their competitive capacity to compete, but then everyone does it. Yep. So it could end up just being a larger cost in the yep. macro front of each okay. side. Uh, David, uh, you know, you've uh, negotiated many deals on behalf of players. As you're thinking about data and data analytics and how that's maybe changed or shaped what happens in the negotiations? What's been your experience? Well, I've always felt when a, from the time I was in my early 20s that you're going to sit down in a room and negotiate against an expert like Jerry West or Red Auerbach, who's the two the greatest general managers in NBA history, and they've forgotten more about what you're talking about than you know. And so when I realized that at about age of 26, I realized that my job was not to debate talent or performance. It was to debate economic impact. So, for example, in 1985, the first year the NBA had a lottery, we had a rookie named Patrick Ewing, and he signed a contract for 50% more than the highest paid veteran in the history of the league had ever made. It wasn't because of the way he rebounded or blocked shots. It was because the league created a lottery, which made the odds of the team getting the number one pick one out of seven instead of 50-50. As an economics major, when you make a resource more scarce, you raise its value. So I've always tried as a lawyer with an economic background to try to find things that I could hang my hat on, rational economic arguments of why, what a player's value was. And there's a dramatic difference between a player's value and his talent. Um, as Daryl's saying, if a player's you know, a pretty good player, but there aren't a lot of great free agents and five teams are bidding on him, he may make way more money than he's worth. And if you, if you want to sign that player, you have to pay him. And so, I think, that, I think the data has taken a lot of the emotions out of the negotiations and made it much more rational. But sort of picking up on Jeff's point, in a sport like basketball, 70% of all the contracts today are pre-negotiated. There are no negotiations. You have a rookie wage scale for the guys coming in. You got maximums for the best players. You have minimums for the rank and file players and the teams that are over the cap, which are most of the teams. You have uh, a few mid-level exceptions, biannual exceptions. So you're negotiating 30% of the deals, and there really isn't a lot of creativity left uh, in, in the business to do that. Okay. Michael, you've uh, negotiated uh, deals related to athletes, but not necessarily athletes negotiating with the teams on the other side, but marketing, branding, merchandising, et cetera. Is data analytics a big or a small part? Is it a relevant part, or how does it work out in your field? You know, similar to what my colleagues have said, you know, analytics are very important for us to set the tone for a negotiation, but ultimately, in our world at Rock Nation, whether we're dealing with an artist or dealing with an athlete, it, it really comes down to, you know, and I'll use an artist as an example, you know, can that artist, you know, help move culture, you know, for that organization? You know, how authentic is, is the opportunity? And, and what kind of disruption, you know, we can create? Those are the things that are more important to us when we're sitting and negotiating than the actual analytics. The analytics, again, it helps, it helps set the tone. Um, it, it's great to have all the facts and figures and numbers and comps. But at the end of the day, 
you know, what, what is the artist and what is the athlete going to do to impact the business of the organization that we're negotiating with? That, to me, is really the most important facet of the negotiation. Yeah. I would just add quickly because it sounded like analytics are useless almost. But so the conference <laughs> ends after this session. Yeah, <laughs> after this session. This, it should arrest. So uh, you, you asked the question about uh, like two parties that want to mm -hmm. come to you know, like a, uh, a deal, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the analytics play a much bigger part on both sides in who mm -hmm. you're pursuing and how hard each side pursues, right? So. Right. They may, you, they can talk on there. So they may say, I think that's a good match for, even if it's not the highest value, this contract will help set them up for the next one. For us, it's like, okay, what's our walkaway price? We know this guy's probably going to get bid out of it, so we probably won't even begin that. So the, an, the analysis of the player comes way more in before you get to the table. Mm -hmm. Once you're at the table, I think it becomes more traditional Agreed. negotiation. That's a good yeah. point. Uh, and not just setting the stage for what each individual team might want and which negotiations to enter, but as, as Jeff said earlier, the broader environment within which negotiations can even take place, uh, which is sort of the direction we want to go a little bit further now anyway, uh, which is looking at the environment in which the negotiations take place. And uh, I'll start out with Michael uh, this time. And again, because you do negotiations in a variety of different industries, can you give us a sense about how those negotiations are different when you're representing an athlete versus an artist? Are they sure. similar in some ways? Are they different, different in notable ways? Um, you know, David made a great point when he said that, you know, the creativity as it relates to a negotiation with a professional athlete, um, you know, has been lost because of collective bargaining. Um, you know, and I, and I would agree with that. Um, you know, athletes are much easier than artists. Um, you know, athletes are, uh, at least on the brand side, are predisposed to brand partnerships. Um, you know, we'll sit down at a table and negotiate an athlete's contract. We'll have a pretty good sense you know, as, as to what those dollars are going to be. On the artist side, rather, it's really a blank canvas. Um, you know, and there's no guidelines, there are no parameters for the negotiation. And, you know, artists are different just in terms of individuals. Um, they're not as predisposed to align themselves with brands. They're very sensitive to their image and the perception. Um, they never want to feel as if they're being sold out um, to a specific organization. So it makes it a little bit more challenging. Um, also, with regards to an artist, you have to do a lot of internal selling, which isn't the case um, when you're dealing with an athlete. So on the artist side, you're, you're constantly dealing with the record labels, you're dealing with the publishers, you're dealing with management, and if, me if music is being bundled as part of the opportunity, you also have to negotiate to clear that music. So it, it's much more complicated on the artist side as opposed to the athlete side. Mm -hmm. uh, is that also a place where you think that the negotiations end up being or the value you bring to the table is significantly more because there's, it is a much more unique situation, whereas maybe anybody else can handle the negotiation that happens with athletes. They're more streamlined, they're more parameterized, whereas this is something where you really do have a bit of a, an advantage. Without a doubt. I mean, on the artist side of the business, and you know, I've been with Rock Nation now for two years, so I've had the exposure yeah. um, you know, over the last 24 months to that side of the business specifically, yeah. um, their need to have us at the table and to really negotiate on their behalf and to take them through the sales or the negotiating process is much more important. Um, on the athlete side, again, on the contract side, there's, there's not a lot of creativity there. And on the brand partnership side, it's also a little bit easier because most athletes are very in tune to what their worth is. Um, they understand the value of creating that business portfolio. Uh, and there's a lot of interest in doing that mm -hmm. versus the artist side where you really need to push them and educate them and really bring them along. So David, I'll bring you in on this because I think what I just heard is, you know, what you do is easy. Uh, not much creativity required. Uh, basically a commodity. Uh, when you're negotiating on behalf of, of, a, of an athlete, d does the athlete matter or does the stats of the athlete matter? You basically have an asset and it's down to the agent negotiating the deal as well as they can and that's how it goes or does it matter whether the athlete themselves is in some way a good or bad negotiator or handles themselves in the right or wrong way? I mean, how do those things play out either behind the scenes or at the table? Well, I, be, I believe that a lawyer who represents himself has a fool for a client. So um, I think that athletes are, create their value on the, on the field, on the court, and our job is to translate their on-the-court performance in, into dollars. I think if you're good at what you do, um, you can make a, a, a major difference in how much money the player makes. Um, the one thing I would sort of dif differ with, with Michael is that I don't think athletes understand what their value is. I think today's young athlete, I think, are over-consumed with branding. Uh, I got called by the parents of a 
really terrific tennis player. I haven't done tennis in 35 years. And they said, I'd like you to represent my son because you're great in branding. And I said, respectfully, your son has never won one tennis tournament. Why don't you try to hire someone who could help him win a tournament before you worry about the market? <laughs> How'd they take that? I, I mean, I, I think they understood it, but I think that, you know, I hear, I hear athletes today saying, like, I'm working on my brand. And I said, well, you don't have a brand. You know, there's a difference between having an identity and having a brand. There's only a few brands that everyone universally recognizes. And I think that the, you know, today, as entertainment sports have overlapped in a significant way, everybody wants to be a brand. And I think it's a very unrealistic expectation. So we had a client this last summer named Greg Monroe, who had four teams came in. They all offered him the max salary. Two teams are for big markets, two teams from small markets. And one of the big market teams spent 20 minutes telling him how, how this would improve his marketing opportunities. And he said, you know, honestly, I don't consider myself to be a marketable player. I'm a center, you know, I, I'm a low key guy. Uh, and he ended up picking Milwaukee. And when all the reporters asked him, how could you pick Milwaukee over New York and LA? He said, I'm not a real estate agent, I'm a basketball player, you know, which I thought was a, a great answer. So I think that, I think like most pendulums, you know, prior to 1984, when Michael came out, team sport outfits really weren't very marketable. Other maybe OJ Simpson, you know, one or two players. Guys didn't even make money with shoe deals. Uh, when I did my first year in 1976, I had three of the top six players in the draft. I think I got $2,500 a year for wearing Nike. You know, Michael changed all that, and in the 30 years since he changed it, every athlete now comes out almost preoccupied with branding as opposed to playing. Michael never worried about branding. He worried about becoming a player, and everything flowed from being a great player. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's where the emphasis should be. So I think there's way too much of an emphasis on branding by people who inherently don't have brands. Go ahead, Professor, let me, just, just to follow up on that, I, I want to just cite an example of a, of a recent negotiation that we had where I think the branding off the field really helped uh, us negotiate that contract. Uh, Des Bryant uh, is a client of ours. He came to us two years ago, going into the last year of his relationship with the Cowboys or the contract with the Cowboys, and he recognized that in order to get the contract that he wanted, in order to stay a Cowboy, which was his dream, that he had to do a reset with his brand. It was very, very important to him to start developing a better relationship you know, with his brand partners, to increase his business portfolio, to educate people on who, and who he was off the field so that the Cowboys felt more comfortable about him. Mm -hmm. And we took him through a process that, that, quite frankly, lasted about 12 months to do that brand reset. And many of you in the audience may have read the Rolling Stones magazine that came out last summer, which really gave people a great insight on, on who Des Bryant was and is. And that had a significant impact when we sat down with Stephen and Jerry Jones and we tried to negotiate our contract, which we were successful in doing. It was critical for them, because the Cowboys are such a, a great brand, it was critical for them to feel comfortable that Des's brand was at the level that it needed to be to be the star player of the Cowboys and quite frankly, to be the face of that franchise. Yeah. We're talking a lot about brand, I wanted to go to, to Jeff. I'm tempted to ask you about the brand of the NFL, but I'm instead going to ask you about things I actually care about. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, one of the other contexts within which the negotiation takes place is, is really the culture and the relationship between, with, between the two sides. You had a collective bargaining agreement a few years ago. You're going to have one some years uh, ahead of you. As you look forward to that negotiation, how would you define the, the climate or the culture that's going to be probably prevalent, the thing that's going to be in the room? Uh, any major barriers or key issues you sort of think you're going to need to, to deal with? Can any of those be dealt with in advance? I mean, what do you foresee happening? Uh, let me just comment on the last point and then uh, yeah. answer your question, Professor. What, what you were saying, Michael, about um, Des Bryant and the Cowboys, I think it's true across our league. And it's no secret we've had issues and we've needed to address them and times we didn't address them as effectively as we should have, and I'd like to think we're doing better on that today. But the players recognize as well that you have 1,800 or 2,000 players in the National Football League, and they are almost all, to a man, upstanding, decent, hardworking men who are good to their families, who are great in their communities, and they are tired of being tarred by a handful of people who misbehave. Right. And I think Des recognized that. 
and the clubs are recognizing that. And the Cowboys and other clubs let go of some rather high profile, rather talented players who have had off the field problems and they kind of made the decision enough is enough. I don't know that that's a data analytics question, but it's certainly a brand issue yes. and it's certainly a fan appeal issue. And it's a great thing that players are taking charge of that now and that players are recognizing that, that they have as much of an interest in preserving their own reputation, their club's reputation, the league's reputation, as everybody else does. Right. I think that's a terrific, terrific development. Right. Now, to your question, we, um, our agreement is halfway through. It's a 10-year deal. We've finished five of those 10 years, and we're about to enter the sixth of the 10 seasons. So in the ordinary course, you would be looking at a negotiation in two th starting you know, in 2020 when the agreement is going to expire. Our history, I don't know that it will happen here, but our history since 1992 has generally been to try to engage in discussions earlier, see if you can get an extension, avoid getting to a, a crisis type point. And, and I think if there's a mutual interest uh, to do that, that would be the most constructive thing. I think the atmosphere for the negotiations whenever they take place is likely to be very different from what it was in 2001. That was a contentious negotiation. There was a work stoppage. There was litigation. There were a few not so kind comments made about one another. Uh, but we got together and, uh, and we got a deal. And I think what you have seen over the past five years is that the deal has worked exactly as it was expected to work. And there were some comments made just within the past week on the eve of free agency about how great the deal has been working for players. And that's what we expected, and we are happy with that. We think the deal has worked well for players. It's worked well for clubs. We have a game that is more competitively balanced than it has been in many years. We have a deal where clubs of any market size are able to compete for playing talent to attract it or retain it on an equal basis. We have a deal where the salary cap is going up very substantially, more than $10 million a year for the past three years. But that only happens because revenues are keeping pace. So the clubs are happy, they don't feel squeezed, the players are happy, they're getting great contracts. So I think we have a deal that's working well. Are there areas where we would want to make changes or the union would want to make changes? Of course. But I think we can have that conversation in an atmosphere of mutual respect and an atmosphere where we can both look at each other and say, what we thought was going to happen in 2011, when we made this deal, really has happened. So, so we don't need to tear down the structure. We've got so, something pretty good. You know, it sounds pretty good. It sounds, sounds pretty <laughs> promising. And hopefully it will work out that way. But you look at all different leagues, not just the NFL. You can look at the NBA. You can look at the NHL. You can look wherever you want. And you see that you know, when the money's on the table, somehow things do start getting a little bit uglier than people had hoped. Um, I'm wondering what's happening behind the scenes on those days. Uh, in your role, for example, I mean, you're both on the legal side, you're helping negotiate. It, do you find your job to be to tell everybody, oh, listen, listen, you know, we're, this is just escalating out of control. We need to just go back to this whole nice idea that we can all get along. There's a lot of, or is your job to say, hey, man, they're, they're hitting us. We got to hit back. And then I mean, wh what's going on? Is it, a, is it a tight ship? Is it a strategy that gets us where, where we get to when it's escalating out of control? Or is it something that's just completely their fault? Well, I don't think, I don't think anything, there are not many things in life where it's all their fault. And that's true in sports, it's true in politics, it's true with a, a marriage and a family, you know. Um, there's not many things that it's all their fault. You keep emphasizing all, so you're sort of implying like mostly might be the case, <laughs> but not all. Well, it depends, you know. <laughs> um, but I think you've got to, and, and you know, uh, Daryl made the point about selling a house. And anyone who's ever sold a house knows that the one thing that you hope doesn't happen is that you get a call from the people who you sold the house to, because it's likely to be that there's a problem or bad news or something like that. That's a real walkaway transaction. These aren't walkaway transactions. These are partnerships. There are, they are as profound a business partnership as there exists. The partnership between teams and owners and unions and players. It's as profound a partnership as there exists anywhere in the world, in my opinion. And if we can't, and they can't, get along with one another and recognize that what binds us together, what we have in common, 
is so much more powerful and so much more meaningful than what divides us, then we really are in trouble. And I think, and I may be just, you know, I may be a cockeyed optimist here, but I think that we, I think we may have, have gotten over that hurdle. And I, I think that we will have a negotiation whenever it happens that will start from that premise and stay with that premise. That doesn't mean it won't be tough. Yeah. That doesn't mean there won't be disagreements. That doesn't mean there won't be compromises or trade-offs that have to be made. But the fundamentals of the sport are healthy and the fundamentals of the relationship are sound. So I, w I want to go to Daryl uh, in a second. I, I sort of get the sense that if there's a, a contested or a brokered uh, convention, in the GOP, I think you're ready to throw your uh, hat in the race as you come across as, as, a, as the one uniter that they, they might be able to find. Uh, Daryl, uh, you know, I want to ask you a little bit about the context within nego which negotiations take place as well, and, and more specifically in this case, you know, uh, you're negotiating deals, you're negotiating trades of players. Uh, there's a regulatory environment that you need to to respect, and some constraints that are put on there. Different sports set things up differently. Do you look across other sports leagues, uh, whether they're the NFL or, or, or the, uh, the NHL or, or other leagues, that you think, you know, they have certain rules and regulations that are different that, you know, might be things that the NBA can learn from or vice versa to maybe improve the environment within which negotiations themselves take place? Yeah, I think um, on, the, on the NBA side, I think actually Michael, David, and I have all referenced sort of our frustration with how fixed a lot of the things are. I, for me personally, I think for you guys might agree, the, you know, the more degrees of freedom you can have in the negotiation, the more creativity allowed, the more, the more value you can, can create. Now, I recognize that the league offices have a, have a duty at some level to limit complexity. You wouldn't want these deals to be like collectivized debt obligations that you can't <laughs> unwind and understand where everything's going. So the, there's an obligation to limit complexity uh, I personally think it's it's two one way with most of the leagues across all leagues. Jeff might disagree. Um, I, and then if you look across, I mean, I only look for improvements. So like when I look at the NFL, one of the things that I like is they've, you know, the goal of a trade, honestly, is to create more value both sides. Like, obviously, they, you know, eat the players happier, the position fit is better in our sport. Uh, so I think uh, making those trades more liquid is a good thing. And one of the things that limits that liquidity is the nervousness and risk on each side. So take, for example, in our sport, if you're trading for a player in his last year who could become a free agent, well, if you do that and then they leave, it's just sort of, oh, well, too bad. The other sports have compensation picks. Uh, the NFL allows you to add, you know, if you re-sign the guy, you then send another pick to that team um, that could only be good in my mind. Obviously, you can, you know, you can negotiate that you're not going to get that. But having that option, I think, allows good trades for both sides to uh, flourish. Jeff, you want to weigh in? Well, just to give a tip of the hat to the NBA here, for a long time, a high pick in the NFL was untradeable because it carried such an extraordinary contract burden. So you look at, you go back to, you know, five, six, seven years ago, the teams that had the top 10 picks in the draft, they, were, they would get a good player, but the price was so extraordinary that those picks were untradeable. We revised our own rookie system in a way not dissimilar to what the NBA has, and you now see trades involving higher picks. And again, to your point about liquidity, it's an asset that is much more exchangeable and you can get better value, and the player may end up at a, at a better place for him. And, and you may not know, at this conference, there's a paper years ago, and actually the author's here, called Loser's Curse, which is about how getting losing in the NFL was really bad because you'd actually get a higher pick, which was worse, because you had to pay them way too much money. So. Uh, uh, among other reasons. <laughs> David? David? Yeah. I, I was going to pick up what Jeff said. You know, w one of the things that astounds me in the collective bargaining process is that We've been in a fixed economic relationship in the NBA since 1982 when they implemented the salary cap for the first time. And it's varied between roughly 48% and 57%, which is not really a big swing. And so once you're in a fixed economic relationship, whether you're 50-50, 60-40, 90-10, and you're fixing it, the only way either side can make more money is to make the product better. And, and one of the great anomalies 
in basketball, we've had two lockouts since 1998. Football had a very contagious one, as Jeff uh, referenced. And the public, th that doesn't make the product better. The public doesn't like reading about injunctions and you know, lockouts and strikes. They want to watch the game. And I think we really shoot ourselves in the foot by having these public displays of billionaire owners and multimillionaire players bitching that you know, they're not making enough money when the unemployment rate is you know, double digits. And at the end of the day, so little has changed when the deals finally get made that you wonder like why we didn't save all the energy and try to figure out a way to grow the game. So, you know, just as a quick overview, you know, what football's what, eleven and a half billion in revenues now roughly? And baseball's about seven and a half to eight, basketball's about five and a half. Basketball's played in two hundred and forty countries around the world, two of which have forty percent of the world's population, India and China. Basketball should be at twenty billion. And so whether the players went from 50 to 52 or 50 to 57 pales in comparison to making the revenues 20. LeBron would make four times more money if the, if the revenues was where they were, should be. Part of that is the collective bargaining interchange, and part of that is what Darrell was noticing is improving the internal rules to make the product better. And it frustrates the hell out of me that we spent so much time as like antagonists. Like one of the great things that Gene Upshaw did as the head of the union in football, it was a horrible relationship for many years. Ed Garvey, who was a good guy, was a socialist, maybe almost a communist, and they never got anything done. And Upshaw came in and said, gosh, we're printing money. This is the NFL. It's really America's sport. Let's stop fighting and start. And, and the salaries just went through the roof. So, so David, although you gave a nod to Darrell's uh, idea there earlier about you know, making it easier for, for teams to make trades that make both sides better off, actually what you're suggesting uh, might sometimes lead in a different direction because what you're saying is what you want to be optimizing for is the more amount of money coming in from the outside into the league. Absolutely. So just because two teams are both better off and the players involved are both better off doesn't necessarily always equate to the fact that the game is getting better. But so they're interrelated. what you'd really want to optimize for if you are the czar in charge of increasing the right kinds of trades that make the sport better might lead to a slightly different set of rules. But I think one's the macro, one's the micro. So yep. If, yep. if you're a team and you're not very good, and you know if you study the NBA, only 11 teams have won a championship in the last 35 years, which shows you a lot of teams aren't being very well run. You know, in hockey, and it's much more fluid or in football. As he said, NFL doesn't care whether the finals are Cincinnati and, you know, Green Bay, two really small market teams, whereas in basketball, there's an underlying feeling that the league is scared to death that it's going to be Utah playing Charlotte in the finals, and the ratings are going to be like 0.1 on the Richter scale, <laughs> you know. Um, and a lot of people have these conspiracy theories that you get to the playoffs and all of a sudden there's a bad foul call because they want certain teams to get into the finals. But if the trades that Daryl's talking about improve a team and make it better and there are more competitive teams competing for the championship, it just makes the overall product better. One of the great things about football, and I did football for a number of years, is that you get to week 13 and a team that's five and nine is still in the playoff hunt. You get to the NBA in January, and their teams are out of it already. They have no prayer of making the playoffs. So if you're a fan of that, I, I won't mention teams because I have one of the people in the audience today. <laughs> but um, if you're a team that's won less than 10 games and you're totally out of it, how do you expect the fans you know, to support the team? It's, it's way better to have more parity. Um, and so I think if improving internal things like one team making it easier to trade I think it makes the overall product better and everyone profits. All right. I'm going to be sensitive to the fact that we're, we're starting to get some questions in from the audience as well. So we're going to do our, our rapid round uh, of, of questions. Again, uh, the ground rules here <laughs> are, are pretty simple. <laughs> what we're going to do is I'm going to just ask you the question. It might be a fill in the blank. It might be a multiple choice. It might be you know, a one word answer. Uh, just keep it to the word or two words needed. No long explanation needed. If something interesting comes out of it, don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll probe on it. And uh, we'll just sort of, sort of zigzag back and forth. We'll start off sure. uh, with Jeff. Um, for this one, you can't pick a family member. You can't say, like, oh, my <laughs> kids or something. Uh, who comes to mind as the best negotiator you've known? Uh, I might say Gene Upshaw. OK. And one of the best is OK. It doesn't have to be the best. No, so I, I might can... say Gene Upshaw yeah. for exactly the reason David said. Yeah. David? Jerry Reinsdorf, who owns both the White Sox and the Bulls. Michael? Uh, Jay-Z. Jay-Z, all right. 
Danny Ainge. Don't laugh. <laughs> Don't laugh. <laughs> Don't laugh his life's on right here. Uh, Daryl, what did you say? Danny, Danny Ainge. Ainge. All right. Fill in the blank. The worst mistake a negotiator can make is to blank. The worst mistake a negotiator can make is to? Uh, not listen. Not listen. Michael? Underestimate his competition. David? Be inflexible. Make it about yourself. Yeah, this is a course on negotiation in like nine seconds you got there. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to go to class anymore, folks. Uh, Even your class? Uh, no? Well, my class is different. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, this one is a multiple choice. Uh, you must answer. The next, so now we're starting on Jeff's end. The next collective bargaining agreement negotiation in which league will lead to the most amount of games canceled? NBA, NFL, NHL, or MLB? Uh, as John Kasich said, I'm not going to bite. <laughs> uh, would you say not the NFL? I certainly hope not. Okay, David? Uh, I would say the most likely is the NFL, uh, the, N the NHL. NHL. NHL, all right. Michael? The data, the history is, is on your side there, so that's it. Michael? Um, having come from the NHL and having worked in that league for many years, I would say the NHL. <laughs> <laughs> I also have to avoid that question. You have to avoid that <laughs> yeah, question. Sorry. All right, fair enough. I, uh, I would answer normally. But... All right, uh, <laughs> you can tell me later. Uh, <laughs> yes. All right, starting with you, uh, Daryl. Would you rather negotiate against a great negotiator or a horrible negotiator? Oh, boy, we debate this a lot. Well, you got an um, answer? I have to do a short answer? It's, yeah, it's the very... one word, in, great or horrible? Uh, horrible. Yeah. Michael? Great. David? Great. <laughs> Great, David? Great. Wrong answer. Jeff? Great. Daryl, after all that thinking, you got it wrong. Uh, no, there's so much, uh, he, he may be like, the only one who's... Who, it's uh, like, do you get a home run or do you get a lot of singles? I'll, I'll go for yeah, the, the problem with horrible negotiators, I think, is that they just get in the way of good deals. That's right. You know, they, they, they destroy it for both sides. That's right. uh, and if it's a simple, you know, if you're selling a house, yeah, horrible sounds But good. you also have serendipity. Yeah. All right. All right, uh, best, starting uh, uh, with you, Jeff. Uh, your biggest weakness as a negotiator. And you can't, this is not like you're not one of the folks looking for a job here who says, oh, I work too hard or something. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I care too much. They're uh, scared of me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're... Uh, not managing expectations properly. David? I'd say it's being in it long enough to actually feel you know what's going on and you know what you think a good result should be and getting frustrated you can't reach the, what you feel is the, the proper result. Okay. Michael? Um, too trusting. Too trusting. I would say the reverse of what I said. So with re tight deadlines, you can lose the understanding the other side, the listening yeah. aspect. The listening shuts down sometimes with, with time yeah, pressure. Yeah, with, like, with time pressure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, Daryl, uh, you have two job candidates who want to join your team in some capacity. Mm. One of them is the best data analytics person by far, and one knows the sport or your industry, depending on who's hiring, better than anyone else. Which one is more likely to get the job? The best data, data analytics person you've ever seen or the person who understands your sport better than anybody else you've come across? Uh, the latter. All right. Michael? Neither. <laughs> uh, because you don't need anybody? I, I, or because I look, for, I look for passion. I look for commitment. I, I didn't see passion as I, I look choices. for hard work. Okay. <laughs> you, I, I believe we started That's with you have, you have two job cheating. candidates. <laughs> you must hire. Okay. Uh, David? Okay. As the general manager of my team, uh, if I'm looking for someone, I need, if I need a I have a, a need for an analytics person. I'll hire the best data person if I have a need a person <laughs> for personnel. And I think that, no, I don't want to be. I think I the think rules the, have come, gotten completely <laughs> yeah. away from us. No, like, well, yeah. Let's start with me. Like, well, I think the mistake. The I think this the is mis what happens when one person breaks the rules. <laughs> but I think the mistake that's made is that it's like when you draft. If you draft and you need a great quarterback. No, no. I was wondering what you needed right now. If you were going to have one intern, one person, who, who's more needed? I'd always pick number two. Okay, the, the, sport, the person I understands. I pick judgment over me mechanical knowledge. Yeah, is that so hard? Okay. Jeff? <laughs> what, what was the question again? <laughs> You're going to hire one person, summer intern, job, whatever. What does your team need? The best data analyst person that's ever walked through the door or the person who understands the NFL better than anybody who's walked through the door? Well, 
knowing that this is going to result in a flood of resumes, the first person. <laughs> Analytics? <laughs> All right. We just data data There's person. hope. All right. Uh, we thought we'd. All right. Did you get um, that starting with Jeff, coming this way. In general, what's more important, being right or being nice? What's your tendency, whether it's the right tendency or not? Where, where do you tend to fall? I think, I think you, need to, you need to do the right thing. And, uh, so, so, and being and right or being nice? And sometimes that means saying or doing something that people don't, don't being want. Being right. Yes, sir. David. Absolutely. I think this is, in my business, you're not going to be popular when you walk in the door and you're asking someone to pay an enormous amount of money for a player who maybe has barely finished high school. You have to do the, what you believe is right and have the person respect you and understand the problem. You're not going to win a popularity contest. Michael? Being right. Daryl? Yeah, it's same. Being right. All right. Uh, what is the most effective trait of a great negotiator? What makes somebody a great negotiator? Now, you've already said what makes somebody a bad negotiator. What I'd like you to think about is what are the things that, you know, are the differentiators, the things that most people don't have but would really, really be the thing you want to add to your toolkit if, if you're trying to advise someone to be a better negotiator? I think they're creative and, uh, uh, you know, uh, when you get at loggerheads, that's just the starting point. All right. Like just good preparation. Preparation? Creativity. I think negotiations is a process of creatively solving business problems. At least in Michael's business and yours, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff? I think you, have to, I think you have, to, have to listen. You have yeah. to really listen. You have to, you have to understand what the other side is saying to you from their perspective, not from your own. Uh, last question. Uh, you can get help from the moderator on this one if you need. Uh, <laughs> One book on negotiation that everyone here should buy uh, is uh, bonus points for naming a book written by someone oh, sitting gosh. within 20 feet of you. Exactly. I, need, I need some help. Just kidding. All right, that's not a real question. Uh, the answer is negotiating the impossible on bookshelves soon. All right, we're going to move to, uh, yeah, it sounds like self-promotion, but the fact is, you know, I don't really care if any one of you runs out and buys a book. Uh, yes, he does. I do care if 100 of you run out and buy the book. If that, <laughs> if that is going to happen, then by all means. Uh, OK, we're going to get some questions from the audience. Uh, I'm just taking a look at it now. So, so just, uh, you know, I'll start with the, the first question I see, and then, and then, we'll, then I'll you know, filter them a bit more. Uh, it doesn't say who they're for, so uh, let's see. At the high end, with max salaries, has the key negotiation for the player become collective bargaining agreement and what's around them? Uh, I'm not sure I quite understand the question. So uh, as a key negotiation for the player becomes a CBA. Oh, so is, is a CBA the, the main source of negotiation now, given high max salaries? I assume that's what it's trying to say, but maybe not. Uh, I'm going to switch <clears throat> to something else. I can uh, take a quick crack at that. Go like, ahead, well, once, I think maybe what they're asking is, you know, once, once every team can offer almost the same, then yeah, then the, the, it becomes about everything else. It becomes about, you know, winning, you know, branding, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it, all right. your tax, your, your state income tax, or none, or none. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Daryl and David. <laughs> Daryl and David, how much do you think the cap on individual salaries limits parity in the NBA? So this is for Daryl and David. Say it again. How much do you think the cap on individual salaries limits parity in the NBA? Oh, no. greatly. <laughs> a lot? Uh, well, I think the NBA intrinsically, you know, David wanted parity. That won't happen with seven-game playoff series in the NBA where you already have the most deterministic game on an individual level, and then you do it seven times. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we need a lot more randomness in the NBA uh, so people can compete and not know before they start that they have no chance. Um, and... Oh, it's, it's true. I mean, there's just very few teams that can win on a given year. And uh, so, yeah. David? I don't think that the cap, I think the cap promotes parity. I think the thing in the NBA that's most missing that football has had from the day the NFL was founded was total revenue sharing. Um, when the Lakers make um, $150 million a year in local television rights and another team may be making $10 million, it's almost impossible to compete um, on, a, on a serious level. And that's one of the great things the NFL has. I don't think historically it's possible 
to go back and recreate that in basketball. I don't think the Lakers are going to agree to give the Utah Jazz a piece of their local television deals, or the Knicks will do that. Uh, and I think, I think that's why the teams that can go $100 million over the cap in luxury tax like Brooklyn did, uh, or the Knicks did some years back. Uh, one year when Isaiah was running the Knicks, the Knicks won 27 games, Phoenix won 62, uh, and the difference in their payrolls was $100 million. The Knicks had $100 million more in salary to win 35 less games. If you, if you have the ability to do that, you, you know, it's very, very difficult to have parity. Well, I just to finish the answer, like Miami, their, their run of two championships could not happen without that environment. Uh, it's a question on, on brands. Uh, wh what's a brand that is currently not leveraging active athletes that could also help grow an athlete personal brand? I mean, what, what kind of branding opportunities are out there that are being missed? Michael? You know, we, um, I'll give an example of a brand that we're starting to do some business with is uh, Zappos.com. Um, you know, online retailer that's never really used athletes or celebrities to promote their brand, to promote their destination, and also to promote their vendors. And what you're going to read about over the next couple of weeks are some significant deals that we've recently done. Uh, one in particular with a top NFL draft pick, which has never been done before. Um, and so, you know, I would use them as a great example. And, and quite frankly, you know, as somebody that's involved in that world every day, there are so many brands that aren't using athletes, that aren't using celebrities uh, to build their brand and to reach their customers. Um, but, but you're starting to see some of those non-traditionals um, get into this space. And it's really good to see because it's growing the pot. Um, it's creating new opportunities for, quite frankly, athletes that um, ha have never been able to build their portfolio before. Uh, and this particular uh, individual who will announce over the next you know, couple of weeks with Zappos.com uh, will be a huge surprise. Well, I have a question on that. What are the best, this is similar to the one you got, but what are the best companies, like if you had a set of not shoe companies, not the obvious ones, that you'd say that company, if they used an athlete to help promote them, would get the biggest boost. Like what, what area is that, do you think? It's a great question. You know, I'll just you, I'll give another example of a company that is somewhat of a traditional brand, but you know, they took a big leap of faith with us, is Puma, uh, which is right, based right here in, in Boston, uh, a company that, you know, when I was growing up, uh, was one of the leaders of the pack uh, in their space, and obviously over the last two decades have had some significant issues, and, and they were looking for a new face, they were looking for a game changer, they were looking for someone that could move culture and, and really make them relevant with millennials, and we aligned them with Rihanna, and what she's done for that brand you know, over the last 15 months has been absolutely incredible. Um, their sales are up 45%. It's a brand that's become relevant. When you're walking on the streets, you see them more often. And so, you know, I think if you have the right personality uh, that's willing to, willing to really work on behalf of the brand and you can align it, you know, with somebody that needs help, then you have the opportunity to create a great partnership. And I think Puma's a super example. I'd like to answer the question backwards. I think that, I think one of the things that's happened is that because there's not a lot of creativity in the industry, enough creativity in the industry, that when Michael Jordan did a commercial with Larry Bird 30 years ago for McDonald's, nothing but net, and 30 years later, Dwight Howard does the same commercial with LeBron James, I want to cry. I want to say, come on, give me something new. Because I think that when you talk about doing something with Des Bryant, I'm a big Cowboy fan, love Des Bryant, you know, you want to raise the bar. When one person in the industry does something really groundbreaking, it creates opportunities for everyone else in the industry. And even though it's a cutthroat business and nobody wants to give anyone credit for doing anything, like if, if I saw that Des Bryant did something really amazing that would help Jeff Green, I'd probably set him a bottle of wine and say, hey, great job, you know, you just made me a lot of money. There's not enough of that going on and people keep repeating the same things over and over again which I think makes the, the current brands very stale. To see the guys do every year, Gatorade, McDonald's, the same traditional things. So when you have the new digital media things, which I think is the next wave of untapped companies because the, the barriers to access is so small. To do a commercial on national television during the Super Bowl costs millions. To do a commercial on digital media is very, very inexpensive. It's way more efficient. And I think that that's, that's the road down in the future.
Uh, this next one uh, is really open to all of you. Uh, it's a pretty general question, but I think it's a nice one. Uh, what's the most adversarial negotiation process you've ever been involved with? If, and if you don't want to say adversarial, the worst negotiation experience. You can go in any order. Jeff? Uh, probably when I worked at the Hockey League and we had a uh, work stoppage with the players um, in uh, the early 90s, right after Commissioner Bettman took office. That was a very difficult adversarial negotiation and, um, and uh, got very personal. Uh, and, you know, there were threats made against Commissioner Bettman's safety and things like that. And, you know, that, that was a very, very difficult. And you talk about risking, I mean, I, I really thought we were that close to losing the season. Uh, 1994, Juwan Howard graduated from Michigan, got drafted by the Washington then Bullets as the fifth pick in the draft. Uh, unfortunately, that year, the number one pick uh, had asked his owner in Milwaukee for, an 80, for a $100 million contract. Uh, the owner, one of the great lines in sports, said, I'll tell you what, you give me $100 million, you can have my whole team. Um, the, <laughs> the, owner in Washington, the owner in Washington was outraged and really hardballed Juwan Howard. Uh, he missed seven games of his rookie year, uh, ended up making, we asked, we asked him for a six-year contract for $24 million, uh, and over his first six years, he ended up making $52 million. Uh, but it was very, very unpleasant. Michael? I, uh, in my previous life before um, Rock Nation, I was with the Florida Panthers of the National Hockey League, and in my 12 years there, I sold the franchise three times, and uh, the second sales transaction was a very challenging negotiation um, on both sides, you know, for the seller as, as well as the buyer, um, and, and it was uh, it created a lot of pain. Um, it, it really hampered the growth, you know, of the franchise at that time, which was you know an organization that was suffering uh, as it was. Um, so that was probably my my most challenging. Darrell? I'll just say conceptually two things. One. Um, one would be when you're working with another side and they won't, they won't uh, be even like tangentially forthcoming to their pressures. So uh, given your understanding of what they're trying to achieve, you feel like it's a deal that should make sense to them. And I, you get that it doesn't have to make sense to them, if you think that, that doesn't. But, but you want them to share, OK, the owner's giving me this pressure, so you can try and solve the issue. But they won't say anything for fear of losing what? Leverage, I don't, you don't know why. Yeah. So that's one that's uh, you know, uh, very tough. And the other one is when they haven't read Negotiating the Impossible, they've read Negotiating 101 from 1950 and they're using their owner as the used car salesman. It's like every like basic tactic, media leaks, just like everything coming at you that isn't about just trying to get to a deal. Yeah. Got it. Uh, this is perhaps related to a question I asked earlier, but uh, it may go in a different direction. Who's the greatest negotiator you've faced on the other side of the table? Oh, wow. Any of you? Can we answer that? I, I mentioned earlier, I think the two, the two best were Jerry Reinsdorf and Jerry Buss, the two Jerry's former of the Lakers, who, when I was very young and there was a lot of deferred money in contracts, Jerry Buss would do the deferred money in his head, which was very intimidating. <laughs> um, I had to buy a Hewlett Packard 12 seat to, to keep up with him. RPM. But he was a brilliant guy. Very, both were very fair negotiators. When I say they were tough, they were intellectually really bright. They were fair. Um, and I think at the end of the day, there is a range of fairness in every deal. Your job as an agent is to be at the upper end of the range. Your job in management is to be the lower end of the range. If you're out of the range, you have a real serious problem. I, I, I'd say... Um, I'd say Jeff Saturday, uh, who was then a player uh, with the Indianapolis Colts, was the president of the NFL Players Association in our last collective bargaining agreement. He represented his side with extraordinary skill and dignity. And, and uh, in, in, in what could have been very stressful, difficult circumstances, he kept the discussions at a, at a, at a high plane, at an appropriate plane. And I thought, really, um, I, I had enormous respect for him throughout and continue to. 
Like, well, I'm still thinking, so you go yeah. first. <laughs> all right, that's all right. Uh, so I'd like to end, you know, uh, on the following. You know, there's a lot of people out here. A lot of them are young folks who are going to be in careers. Some might take a trajectory that's similar to yours. A lot of them will certainly think about careers that are in the same industry as yours. Uh, what advice would you give to these folks? I and mean, we've talked a lot already about what you think in general about negotiations. You know, you've talked about some of your successes and failures, perhaps even, or the weaknesses. But as you think about the people who are at an age, in most cases, much younger than, uh, than the average age here, uh, although especially the average age here, uh, you know, what advice do you give to the young folks in the room who are going to be embarking on a career, perhaps on the data side, but much more on the, in, the, in the sports industry? Jeff? Uh, I think the, uh, you know, when I was uh, back in the back in the day of the, you know, horse and buggy, when when I was sitting where these young people are sitting, I never ever dreamed I would be here today. Um, if you'd made a list of, you know, hundred things that I might be doing professionally, I'm quite certain this wouldn't have been on it. So, just be open, be open. Don't. Don't try to set the path too quickly, and don't try to set the path too far out in the future, because uh, life is, uh, you know, it's an amazing set of experiences, an amazing set of doors opening and opportunities presenting themselves, and be, be open to what's ahead of you. David? I'll take the opposite. Um, when I was <laughs> in law school, I knew I wanted to be a sports lawyer, that was always my burning desire. I wasn't sure I could do it, but it was my dream. Uh, I think today the industry is way more mature than it was when I started. <coughs> um, in many ways, it's gotten very corrupted because it's, because of all the regulations. It's hard to differentiate yourself from other people. People are starting to uh, differentiate themselves in ways that aren't appropriate. Um, since we're promoting books, um, I would say a great book to read is Bill Gates' book called The Road Ahead. Figure out where the industry is going to be five to ten years from now and what kinds of skills you need to have. Um, one skill certainly is analytics uh, at the Fall College of Sports and Human Dynamics. We just started a graduate program in analytics. I think it's very important. I think digital media, as, as Michael was referencing, uh, is where it's all going on the advertising side and branding, uh, having skills in that. Uh, event management on an international level, uh, I think is a, a third area. Um, don't look where the thing was 10 years ago or 20 years ago, but look where you think it's going to be 10 years from now and put yourself at that intersection. And if you want to read the best book on negotiating, read The Ball Truth. <laughs> you know, just, just from a, a basic perspective, you know, I was 13 years old and I knew exactly what I wanted to do in life. And, you know, as I sit up here today, it's, it's been an incredible journey. I've been very blessed. And uh, not only have I um, reached many of my goals and objectives, I've done it with a twin brother who's also in the industry as well and, and the CEO of the Brooklyn Nets. And when I think about how I got where I am today, it, it truly is about hard work. Uh, it's about passion. It's about commitment. It's being loyal. And it's about doing all the things necessary to be successful in life. And assuming that all of you here today want to be in the sports and entertainment business, and that's your dream if you're not already in the business, commit yourself to it and do whatever it takes to get into the game. And then once you get into the game, do things right. Um, be high character, high, high integrity. Be honest. Because those ultimately, those, character, those characteristics are ultimately lead you to success. But at the end of the day, it's really about your commitment. It's about your passion. And you're willing to sacrifice to be the best at what you do. It's a very competitive business. And as I look out here and see the thousands of people that are in this room, many of you will be in this business and have long careers. Many of you will not, because it's that tight of a fraternity. So look next to yourself and ask, your one ask yourselves one simple question. How will you differentiate yourself from the person sitting next to you? Are you going to work harder? Are you going to be more committed? Are you going to be more passionate? Are you going to be more loyal? That's the real question. And if your answer is yes, I'm willing to do those things. Yes, I'm willing to make those sacrifices. Yes, I'm willing to commit myself to being the very best. Then one day, you'll be sitting up where we are here today. 
Well, I yeah. can't beat that answer. Yeah. I'm like inspired. Do you have any advice that's relevant? <laughs> I, I, I would say, because we all get asked that question, I would say the, the, the path the path I've taken or any of the, or any of the panelists have taken is not a useful question uh, because it's different. The, it's going to be, um, who knows what it will be. I would say, you know, I got here with a combination of opportunity, taking advantage of it, and serendipity. Uh, there were all these key moments that were totally random. I couldn't get into sports for eight years or so between Stats Inc. and getting back in with the Boston Celtics. Uh, so it's, it's, it's extremely challenging. Your two challenges, one, I would just add to Michael, one is uh, uh, how do you get anyone to pay attention to even listen to you? Uh, that's, that's a unique challenge, whether it be you know, doing some analysis, uh, you know, traditional things, sending your resume, which isn't very helpful, networking in. But then second, the most key thing is the differentiation point that, that, Michael, that Michael made is you, you have to demonstrate what you can do better than better than someone else. And that's going to be the key thing that, you know, I'm, that I will take more than a few seconds listening to a pitch. And if you're really paying attention to the industry, you'll know what these teams are trying to accomplish, and you've got to hit them at the right moment. Great. Well, we are out of time. I want to thank uh, the panelists for such a great job. Uh, uh, thank you. you know, it's always nice when we have a bit of a diverse panel giving us different points of view on, on the topic of negotiation in sports. Hopefully you got a lot out of it as well, and, uh, and, and we'll call it a day. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, that was fun.